Last week, we talked about how to get your bikini body, and we established that some of us care a lot about the subject of weight loss and fitness for reasons that you might not guess. Because some people will give you a hard time. They'll say, Jen, why don't you... Why don't you accept your body for the way it is? Just, you know, put on that house coat and some slippers <laughs> and just call it a day. You know, stop, just just be, just let it go. Like, not worry about it. As I said last week, it's because some of us have different body types. When you guys gain weight, you're curvy and cute because maybe you have the pear body style or the ruler body style or the hourglass body style. I have the sack of potatoes body style. <laughs> And that is why I put a lot of effort into staying as thin as I possibly can, because when I gain any weight at all, it does not work out for me. So we we talked about that in the last episode, and I actually ran out of time. I, I just ran out of time in the last episode. We were at an hour and 15, and I had not made all the points I wanted to make. So this is part two to the Bikini Body episode, um, inspired by my potato style <laughs> body. And one of the things, I'll talk about the different weight set points that I've been at. And, and, and I like to be an inspiration to you guys, because again, I had six babies in eight years. I have a, a natural tendency towards food addiction, and I, I I have not always been thin. Like Caitlin, pull up that picture. We have a picture from 2005. JF on YouTube.com. This is me in 2005, uh, blonde and 40 pounds heavier than I am now. See, this is why subscribe to my YouTube channel, and mm -hmm. you see pictures of me at <laughs> 40 pounds heavier than I am now. And it's and as you see, it's not really the weight that was the issue. It's that I don't have an hourglass figure. You know, I just I wasn't happy at that weight because um I just don't I, I, I don't I don't have the figure to pull that off. And as we're always talking about the kibby body types, my kibby body type is dramatic. And one of the salient features of having a dramatic body type is sharp lines like angular sharp lines that works well if you have a dramatic body type and as you see there are no sharp lines in this picture of me from <laughs> from 2005 so um don't believe that just because you're in your 40s 50s 60s beyond like you can't lose weight that's it, it's easier for me to lose weight now than it was when I was in my 20s. I mean, that's, that is just nonsense that you can't lose weight as you go on in life. It's ridiculous. So um, yeah, so thank you, Caitlin, for that picture. We'll talk <laughs> about it again later. So I'm going to continue and share some things I have learned in my lifelong quest to keep the weight off because I have the double whammy of the way my body distributes weight is the sack of potatoes style. And then my kibby type is dramatic. So just for a lot of reasons, I should be as thin as possible. That's that's what works for me. So maybe that's not the case for you. Maybe you look amazing like a lot of my friends do with a little extra weight. But look, everyone at some point in their life would like to take off a few pounds. And so we will continue on that subject in this fine, fine episode. As usual, we get to the main topic in the second half of the show. In the first half, I'm going to convince you guys to stop uh, fetishizing reading with your kids. I'm, I'm tired of that being something that people push on their kids. And, and it is kind of the ultimate brag right now in, in this time and place in history. It's like, oh, I just, I can't get my kids away from a good book. You know, my, my child just loves to read 19th century literature. It's like, I think there's something wrong with them. Because 19th century literature is really boring. Mm -hmm. It's And listen, and I read it all. I'm a big reader. I love to read. We are a very literate household in this house. Um, but, you know, let's face it. They didn't have the word processor or anything else to do with their time back then. <laughs> so the Brontes, God love them. But, you know, the Bronte sisters, what did they have to do? They were just sitting around, you know, like, oh, let's describe the moors you know we did the fields in england like 
let's describe an English field like for four pages. I mean, come <laughs> on, it's kind of boring, you know. Uh, and and this was in in a lot of this classic literature. It was before video and pictures, certainly color pictures. And so yes, it made sense to have four pages about what a freaking field in England looks like because. People in other parts of the world didn't know. But now we know, or you if you don't know, you can pull up a picture. So um, I, I, don't, I just don't think it's the flex you guys think it is. Um, oh, I hope I don't forget when we get to that topic. <laughs> Caitlin, see if you can imagine this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, um, I got, I fell in with a bad crowd, a bad blogging crowd back in the day. It was the well-trained mind people. And that those are some mean streets, the well-trained mind crowd. They will get in your head. <laughs> and um, I tried to do family reading time <laughs> where we read classic literature. Well, it, just imagine me. And then keep in mind that my husband is has probably has ADHD, like a more severe level than I do. So when you combine those genes – you have some kids that are like, you think I'm, you think I have trouble staying on track and going on tangent. I mean, it's like having a house full of, I, I don't know, like, <laughs> are spider monkeys known for being really off the ball? If so, that's, that is what our house is like, because all of our kids got like the double genetics for having extremely short patients and high ADHD. And um, I, it's so funny to me that I, ever tried to do family read aloud with classic literature it's the funniest <laughs> thing so i'm gonna get you guys to uh do that i'll probably throw in a you know my usual uh, monthly rant about stop worrying about your kids on screens <laughs> it's going to be a fine fine episode welcome to the jen fullweiler show coming to you from austin texas this is the podcast where you learn the art of the village hustle that's being a hot girl girl boss or hot boy, boy boss, very growing listenership mm -hmm. here. Who knows that love and family and community are the foundation for all true success. I am your host, Jen. I am a best-selling author, stand-up comic, and mom of six. Our lovely producer is Caitlin White. And now you can work with her as well if you want media consulting, video editing, social media management, all that sort of thing, all the podcast producing things she does for me, social media producing. You can look up her info at cat. G studios.com and that's cat with a K cat G studios.com and don't forget to join the Patreon we have a lot of fun on the Patreon mm -hmm. patreon.com slash this is Jen okay oh oh before I get into the main topic don't forget I am coming to Seattle I am only doing one city this spring because we weren't sure if I was going to be alive <laughs> now that we know that I am alive it's very exciting I will be in Seattle I have two shows on Friday March 22nd at the hereafter which is part of the crocodile I guess I guess the crocodile is the whatever I'll be there March 22nd it'll be a lot of fun and that link is in the show notes jfcomedytour.com I cannot wait to see you soon Seattle all right you guys and reading this has been that this has been coming for a while um in parenting circles these days the ultimate flex is to brag about how much your children love to read and so since we parents are always in a one-upping contest with one another, <laughs> and anytime you see any parent being successful in any way on social media, it immediately fills you with a blind panic in which you want to turn your life entirely upside down to uh, do whatever this family is doing so that you can win too. Um, it can, it can go, it, it, it can really get in your head. And I think one of the biggest things that gets in our head and makes us put pressure on our kids is the pressure for them to be readers. Can I just say, who cares if your kids are readers? It doesn't matter. Yes. It, it doesn't impact intelligence. It doesn't impact curiosity about the world. It doesn't impact creativity. This, everyone sits around and says, they're like, well, if you... If you let your kids watch screens for more than a minute a day, they'll lose their creativity. <laughs> creativity comes from reading books. Have you ever found that to be true? Does that does, does anyone actually have 
personal experience that would show that that is true. My kids have some really creative friends. And I mean, a couple of them are readers, but I, I just, I don't really see that going hand in hand with being a, a really intellectually curious and creative kid. Caitlin, you you have four kids. I mean, do you, obviously, <laughs> that would be funny if Caitlin was like, Jen, I think you're dead wrong. You're completely wrong. You can disagree with me. If you think that I am off base, you can disagree with me. What I mean, do you see a connection between kids being highly creative and curious about the world and how much they read paper or Kindle books? No, not at all. I mean, I yeah. think that reading has nothing to do with their curiosity and their creativity. Yeah. So two of my daughters wrote complete novels before they were 10 years old. Let, let, okay, hang on. The, hit the let me back up <laughs> sound effect. I, You need to know my perspective on this. You need to know the, the culture that I am coming from because it will make you realize how right I am when you hear more about my background. I, I don't have some kind of anti-reading, quasi-illiterate <laughs> yeah. background. My, in my family, reading was everything. So, I mean, going back to the grandparents who I knew, my father's grandparents. I mean, we're, we're going deep in the family history here, guys. Um, I mean, first of all, like both, uh, all four of my, well, at least both of my grandmothers were college educated. Like, I mean, I we, we're a pro-education family always have been grandmothers were going to college in the 1930s. Um, and, and my one grandmother who I knew in particular, she read nonfiction books to the crazy extent that she was famous for it in our, in our group of friends and extended family. I mean, she would read like two nonfiction books a week. She was, uh, she was often like bedridden. She has a, she had a variety of illnesses, such a queen, you know, looking back, I mean, that is really, a lifestyle that I aspire to. She was just in bed all the time. I, I literally <laughs> do not have one memory of my grandmother where she wasn't in bed or on the couch. She was either watching sports or reading nonfiction. Just iconic. Like uh, looking back, that's 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 the way to do it. Um, so my grandmother was like the biggest reader you've ever seen. Her fa her house was just full of books. And then my parents, same thing. Both very big readers. Our house was just overflowing with books and. That I remember that's what we would do um, back in the 80s, uh, in, you know, back back in my childhood, when it was a Saturday afternoon, my parents and I would just spend hours reading. We would just sit in the living room and each one of us would have a book and we'd sit there together and we'd read because we were bored <laughs> because TikTok had not been invented yet <laughs> and life was boring before the internet and social media technology. <laughs> Imagine the incredible TikToks I could have been watching. Oh, Imagine yeah. <laughs> the Instagram content I could have been binging, the YouTube videos that could have showed me the whole world without some boring book slowing me down. Uh, <laughs> was so bad okay I did a tangent alert listen guys <laughs> it is so lame to live in the past you fellow gen xers who are like the 80s were so great i miss the 90s when people weren't on screens and they'd hang out together all the time like we were getting high I mean <laughs> well I should we other people who were near me were getting, uh, it wasn't as idyllic as everyone we were so bored everyone makes it out to be like oh it was this idyllic time the 80s and the 90s they, those were the halcyon days when we didn't have as many screens and people would just get together and like that's why they invented the show jackass because we were so <laughs> bored that it's like oh let's get in a shopping cart and roll off a cliff and see what happens <laughs> it was a bad boring time don't romanticize the past guys it's i think that people who live in the past it's like they i think they just don't have good memories mm. it's like we we all in the 80s like we hated each other and you know we 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 didn't get along that well and and there were just there was more drama between my friends back then than my kids friends now well and there was a lot more ignorance racism things like that because if you lived in some small town and you had just never met anyone from Tibet 
and then you see someone from Tibet, you're like, oh, who's that foreigner? I mean, it's it because you didn't know. Now you can follow five people right now from Tibet on Instagram and see what their lives are like, see what they're cooking for dinner. You know, there was so much more xenophobia and racism and 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 all that sort of stuff back then because we were all just so much more isolated. So don't guys do not live in the past. The music wasn't better. The, no, the music was better. We had crisscross. We had flock of seagulls. Like, no, the music wasn't better. Man, if you, like, I was listening to a Doja Cat remix the other day, and I was oh. like, music just keeps getting better every mm-hmm. year. It's just incredible. I love the music we have today. It's so good. I think that you guys are living in the past because you romanticize who you were in the past because you forget your flaws that you had back then and the problems you had back then, you just you just kind of forget. And so you kind of wish that you were still that person. And that's why you talk about everything was better in the 90s. I, I guess that's the thing about me hating who I was <laughs> when, I, when I was younger. I'm like, I, it, I just very clearly remember um, all the bad things about those eras. And I just, let me tell you, just don't don't ever... Don't live in the past. Don't romanticize the past. Things are getting better. You're getting better. Everything's great. The music's better. The food is better. The technology is better. So, okay, to get back on track. All right, <laughs> so back in my childhood, um, most weekends, that is what we would do. I've, I come from a very bookish family. And then my husband, his mother, my, my wonderful mother-in-law, um, she was not a reader at all. She had about the most severe ADHD you possibly could. Um, she didn't. She wasn't able to do well academically. I don't think she graduated from high school because she was taken out of school to go work in the fields. Uh, she was so poor, they didn't have running water in the house that she grew up in. I mean, like that level of poverty. Sometimes her only meal of the day was a little bit of cornbread. So um, she, she knew how to read, but... She just didn't grow up, you know, practicing it ever. And so, uh, and also, again, with her with her ADHD, there was no way. So she was incredible. She was, I mean, you know, she was the one who would like, when uh, she was sitting next to the pool with my daughter, a wasp landed next to her and scared my daughter. So Yaya just grabbed the wasp with her fist, crunched oh it goodness. up and just threw it into the grass. And I was like, did it sting you? She was like, oh, I I guess. I don't know. Like, I mean, mean, that's her. Like, the toughest woman in the world. Incredible. Um, So, uh, yeah. And like one time, one time I walked in and she was screaming at someone on the phone and, um, and, and talking about politics and like, you know, well, I, I can't believe you could vote for that person in good conscience. He's a crook. You know, he stole all that money from the city council. And, and then it was like, well, screw you too. And more language. And then when she got off the phone, I was like, who was that? And she shrugged and said, wrong number. <laughs> so that was my mother-in-law, incredible woman, not a reader, but I, she would buy <laughs> books for my husband. I mean, my husband had books in his room and She'd say, you know, I hear the the Hardy Boys series. I hear that's good if you want to read. So he would read sometimes, but it wasn't pushed on him. And, you know, he came from this generational poverty. She was a single mother. They were so, so poor. And he ended up going to Yale. He graduated in three years with honors, went to Columbia Law School, uh, Stanford Business School, and studied towards a master's in computer science while he was at Stanford getting his MBA. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and again, that's the graduate computer science program oh. um, at Stanford. Like that's where all the founders of any technology you've ever heard from, heard of. You know, that's Silicon Valley, like that area. So that's that's not nothing. Um, so he's a smart guy. He likes to read. He's highly educated. Um, so both of us have, for different reasons, this background of being very familiar with books for different reasons. Oh, oh, and then... I've written three books mm-hmm. and and it, you could almost count it as six because I had to rewrite my first book, Something Other Than God. I had to rewrite it from a blank page three times. Yikes. Yes, it was insane. So um, yeah, I wrote that book literally three times, start to finish, uh, before I got it right. I think it's past 2,000 reviews on Amazon. By Ooh. the way, if I might, if I might throw that in there. My hard work paid off. I, I, that Writing that book almost killed me. It almost <laughs> killed me. 
But I do. Okay, another tangent. Tangent alert. I <laughs> I just want to say this. Um, you know, people say that you shouldn't work too hard towards your goals because when you finally reach that thing that you were going for, it's never what you thought it would be. And now that my first book has passed 2,000 reviews on Amazon, which was always a goal of mine, um, I can say, that's a lie. (laughs) It's it's everything I (laughs) dreamed it would be and more. Uh, The payoff is exactly what I thought it would be. And um, it's really incredible, honestly. So um, (laughs) it's truly everything I dreamed it could be and more. The sense of satisfaction I get is just so such an incredible, wonderful, deep sense of satisfaction. So um, if you really want to make something happen, you really should push for it because the payoff will probably be everything you thought it would be. Okay, so uh, I know a thing or two about books and words. Obviously, I respect books and words. I've written three of them. Um, and, and and again, my uh, two of my daughters wrote complete novels before the age of 10. Wow. Complete novels. And, and I mean, I would read them and I would think this I, I I almost hesitated to share it with people because I thought they won't believe the girls wrote it. They they won't they will not believe that a nine or ten year old wrote this. They uh, it, it's it's too good. I mean, there's no way that a child you know could have written this. I mean, it was one of my one of my girls. I think she was like eight years old and writing this scene where a, a child. Oh oh and it oh and this was historical fiction. So, it, and I'm I'm saying this by the way not to brag but to establish. When I trash something that a lot of people hold dear in a minute, you need to know this background so that so that my trash talk <laughs> will have maximum potency. So my daughter was eight, maybe nine years old. She wrote historical fiction, did all of this research about 19th century England and what, what it was like to live during that time. And so this this child who lived, I think it was set in like 1823, he's running. She talked about the type of shoes he was wearing, which is the type of shoes kids would have worn at that time. He fell. She describes what the grass felt like on his face. His cheek was to the grass. Yeah. And, it's, and what's interesting, she'd lived her whole life in Texas, but because of her research, she knew that in England, they have <laughs> real grass, not Actual the sticks. <laughs> And rocks and three pieces of crusty hay <laughs> that we call grass here in Texas, but they have like lush grass. So she described that because she knew so much about what uh, what what grass in England would be like. And and then this is this always stands out to me. She described as the bullies drew closer to him because they were chasing him. He could feel the vibration in the ground as against the grass as their footsteps drew closer wrote this completely on her own i did not suggest that she do it i didn't push her to do it i didn't help her do it she just presented all these chapters to me one day and asked what i thought so we we are a pro written word family don't come at me in the youtube comments (laughs) jen hates the written word no no (laughs) No, no. My bona fides are very, very strong for appreciating the written word. So, um, and 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 for passing that along to my kids. So it is it is with that background and that authority that I say stop pushing your kids to read books. What you should encourage your your kids to do is to be curious about the world and in particular to be curious about the slice of the world that they are meant to know about. Um, what, What modern parenting philosophies push you to is that your kids are supposed to care about all these old dusty books about polite people in England and their social dramas that were all written between 1820 and 1890. And and you're just winning as a parent, supposedly, if that's what your kids want to read. It's like uptight white people who have a bunch of problems that are rooted in the fact that they can't communicate with each other because their culture is very repressed. (laughs) 
I mean, did did I not describe most of the Brontes work <laughs> yeah. right there? I mean, yeah. you know, did is did I not just describe Jane Eyre? I'm, I, I, I just lost <laughs> half my pod, podcast subscribership. I realized that. I realized that that um, you know the the Jane Austen fans. I mean, they 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 can be. I mean, honestly, I would rather make anyone i'd rather make a biker gang mad than jane austen <laughs> fans um but but oh and i'm not saying it's bad okay listen listen jane austen fans emily charlotte bronte fans i'm not saying their books are bad i'm not saying their books are bad they're great they're very well written they're, they're good. a little long <laughs> but <laughs> a little plodding <laughs> but they're great I, weathering heights is actually one of my favorite books so um i, I get it but <laughs> <laughs> but um I, I mean it kind of is uptight white people who don't know how to express emotions causing their own problems i mean it, it's a it's a little bit of that is it not so um it is okay if your children are like you know what that's not for me that's not for me that's just not i that that doesn't that doesn't resonate but i'm just not interested in that and you know your kids might end up being interested in an area of the world and an area of life that is that doesn't have to do with reading dusty old books. So, for example, um, my oldest child is he's not much of a reader. I, I mean, he reads sometimes. He's good at reading. I mean, when he needs to read a book for a test, he does. But he does not read for pleasure because early on he realized he loves computer science and he fought hard very hard to have as much screen time as he could as a kid because he wanted to learn computer science now am i naive enough to think he was only ever doing computer science on the computer probably i'm sure he's a kid every single kid would you know i'm sure he was doing goofy stuff on the internet too but we did let him really you know really do what he wanted to do in terms of being on computer science forums where you can ask questions and you know blah 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 and um he spent four years creating an artificial intelligence algorithm that is so complicated and detailed that he had to take seven sheets of eight by ten paper and tape them together to get all of the equations that this algorithm uses out on the paper. I, I believe he had to use tensor calculus. I is it is it oh. tensor calculus? I I don't know. What do, no one in this room knows. We don't I know. Definitely don't. <laughs> I'm not I don't I don't know. Uh, my mom would know. She's you know, she's the mathematician and my husband knows that stuff. I, I think tensor I think I'm not making up that word. I think that is a thing and I think my son used it to create this algorithm. He this was not a school project. This is what he did for fun. Now, if I had enforced reading time every day because I fell in with the most vicious biker gang <laughs> in the world, which is called the Well-Trained Mind Forums, like, man, let me do uh, Those people get in your head. Like, I would rather mess around with Scientology than the Well-Trained <laughs> Mind people. They will get in your head so fast. They will convince you that you are such a loser if you don't, you know, like, well, we we spent two minutes yesterday not studying ancient Greek. And it's like, <laughs> well, have fun when your kids start smoking crack. I mean, it's there's that vibe. Um <laughs> And by the way, a lot of my friends are, they're into well-trained mind stuff. So, I mean, I'm not, well, I am saying everything I'm saying, but <laughs> it's it's a culture that I didn't jibe with. I guess that's all we're trying to say here. Um, so, uh, <laughs> so um, what worked for this particular child is I saw that the area of the world that he was meant to study and have a passion about was computers and computer science. And what that meant is, uh, it, it just didn't make sense to force this kid to have reading time. He wasn't into reading, uh, it just wasn't his thing. But what I did see was curiosity about some area of the world. That's what we should foster in our kids. Sometimes we push our kids into the performative elements that lead to the goal we want. Here's what I mean by that. I mean that ultimately, what do you want from your kids? You want them to have a passion for 
some area of life. You want them to be curious about some element of life, of existence, of the world, whether it's history or technology or whatever it is. And so rather than just say, I want to see that come out in this kid and be fostered no matter where it comes from, you force them to read books because the people on your Facebook forum are always posting pictures of how their kids read books all day. And then they're like lying about how intellectually curious their kids are and it gets in your head. So you force your kids to read books. And if your kid isn't much of a reader, I think what happens is they miss opportunities to foster their curiosity for the world. So my oldest son is that's a, the one who did the the algorithm thing. Um, Again, if I had forced him to spend a lot of time reading books, I don't think he would be the computer science whiz that he is. And that's his big passion. So honestly, I'm not sure he'd be passionate about anything if I had led, made screen restrictions and enforced reading time and all that lead him away from that. And then you guys know my my youngest son. He's the one who is digging the World War One style trench. We've got all the little 10-year-olds running through my house like, to the trench! It's, <laughs> it's incredible. He knows so much about history. I asked that kid anything about the Peloponnesian War. And, and he, was, he was talking about, well, the Peloponnese is like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And w- was like studying ancient Greek. He's not that into languages, but because so many of the wars he studies, you can see some source material if you know a little bit of ancient Greek, he was uh, trying to learn about that alphabet. And he is he's just so knowledgeable about ancient history in particular. I told him I was um, reading a book about Caesar and he just made this passing comment about, well, you know, his relationship with Pompey was really, you know, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I don't think that kid has read a ton of books recently. Again, he is a good reader. He's literate. He knows how to read. Um, but he's not a big reader. He, he did go through a phase where he was reading some books about ancient battles and, and things like that, but he loves to watch educational YouTube channels. He, he binges this, the history content and, and all sorts of, of stuff on YouTube. And, and to that people will say, well, how do you know that what you're seeing on the TikTok and the YouTube (laughs) is accurate? What if it's biased? You don't think our published books are biased (laughs) if you are over the age of 35 think about what you learned about history in elementary school and see if you might see a little bias in there look look most (laughs) groups who convey any educational material especially about history society culture things like that they're biased so yes you might have some inaccurate things on YouTube, but same with the History Channel, uh, same with books, frankly. I mean, so many books are so full of misrepresenting studies, inaccuracies. I see it all the time. Speaking of the main subject, weight loss stuff. Um, oh, there's so much like, well, this study shows that my diet is uh, is is the real one. And you look up the study and it was like six people in the study and all of them were this guy's friends and you know they were also <laughs> on drugs and like maybe that contributed to the weight loss. It's just, there's so much lying in all forms of media that that is not a reason to, um, to have your kids not learn from YouTube. It's a reason to educate your kids that there is bias everywhere. You know, I, I tell my kids, I'm biased. Like everyone's biased. It's just part of hearing information from other human beings. You're going to hear a biased version of it. So, and and if you hear a fact that kind of sets off your red flags, whether it's on a YouTube channel or in the history book that your school teacher gave you, you need to do your own digging. Never, never take information at, at face value and always look at other sources of material before you get an idea in your head is like, oh yeah, this is definitely the truth. And so that's why I never, I never had an issue with my son learning about history or my other son learning about computer science from YouTube and those places because they always knew you can't trust what you hear on YouTube, on TikTok, in history books. And anyway, I mean, you always need to go look at multiple sources if they're citing studies and things like that. Hey, it's the internet. Like, you can look it up. You can see the actual study for yourself and 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 see how it was done. Or with history, you can read other sources who talk about the same thing. Okay, 
Um, let let me uh, take a moment to say we have lost our video. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't even turn into the Joker. That's <laughs> incredible. True. Um, this uh, not inexpensive camera just died in the middle of this episode. So for both of you watching on YouTube, uh, sorry, we had, now we don't have video for the rest of this YouTube video. It's it's back to the old days, man. This is <laughs> this is like old times. OG it is an podcast. audio. Yes, it's OG podcast. It is audio only for the rest of this episode. And I am um, I am learning to control my anger. That's <laughs> it's really. Um, it's great. It's great. No, it's, it's see, it's easy to get distracted by things that go wrong, especially when you are a control freak who has a touch of OCD. Um, I, I am a controlling person by nature, and it frustrates me when things don't go according to plan, and it is hard for me to go with the flow. But that's where you just have to sheer practice, put it out of your mind. It's like, just t- like take that thought and shove it somewhere else. <laughs> just, put, <laughs> just, just put it out of your mind. So I'm not going to fixate on the fact that we don't have video for the second half of this episode. Um, JF on YouTube.com to see the lovely logo that we have mm-hmm. up in place of my um, very, very expensive camera that is not doing what it is supposed to be doing. This is a good time to remind you that uh, episode 30 of the Village Hustle Patreon just came out. It, it is, I was having a lot of fun on that one. That's the one where, oh, what did I talk about on that one? Hang on, hang on. I have a summary here. It was on episode 30. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the one where I had to... Um, fill in for this young TikTok star doing stand-up comedy. So, because he got sick at the last minute. So I had to do comedy in front of a crowd that really did not want me to be there and with whom I have nothing in common with. That would actually be a pretty reasonable assumption to assume that they were not going to like me and to get up on a stage, spotlights on you, everyone's staring at you. You have to make these people laugh. I talked about how I got over that fear, which is not an insignificant fear. Patreon.com slash this is Jen. That is episode 30. Just came out hot off the presses of the Village Hustle Patreon. And again, patreon.com slash this is Jen is that link. So uh, in summary, before we go on to the main topic, that I, I I just want to emphasize to you that pushing your kids to do the performative things that people on Instagram are showing their kids doing, mainly, you know, reading paper books, because you think it will lead to the end result of the happy, wholesome lifestyle that those people are putting forward on Instagram, um, you, you gotta throw all that out the window. The reality is you have no idea what's actually going on in their house. And if their kids are young, you don't know how those kids are going to turn out. Man, (laughs) let me tell you, having a kid who is now out of high school and and early in college, see, I'm seeing how some of the, the family's kids turned out. And, you know, they're great kids, but, you know, some... (laughs) 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 There are some... There's some like well-trained mind type families where, you know, the kids are not spending their weekends uh, going to church and reading 19th century literature. Let me put it that way. And I think I, 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 I just wonder, I just wonder if the kids had had a little more freedom to learn the way that they wanted to learn, perhaps from watching YouTube videos, or even, God forbid, watching some TikToks about an area that they're really passionate about. Even if it's like makeup, just engaging that area of their brain that wants to grow and learn and try new things and get better and fail and try again and fail and try again, like clicking with that part of their brain. If they were restricted from doing that because they were pushed to learn only through books, I think you're going to have kids who are a little lost once they get out of high school. Because speaking of well-trained minds, 
their mind was not well trained to seek out their own interests in the way that works for them, to be scrappy and creative about how to find more knowledge in the area that they are interested in. Their minds were not well trained for that because they had to do all this performative stuff, like staring out a freaking window with a <laughs> cup of tea and a dusty book, instead of being on YouTube, learning how to get really inspired about doing how to do the perfect lip gloss, which sounds shallow, but let's say let's say your daughter's really into that. She she she's really into makeup. She watches all of these YouTube videos. She tries hard. She's she's really learning how to shade that eyeshadow just perfectly. Well, what she's doing is building skills of acquiring knowledge in a certain area and applying it and sticking with it despite failure. That is a skill that she may very well use in a whole different area of life later in life. Maybe she doesn't end up being a makeup artist. Maybe she ends up being a mechanical engineer. But those skills that she developed, l trying and failing and trying again with doing makeup, those skills that she developed back then the, for, uh, again, acquiring knowledge and applying it and sticking with it despite failure, that will set her up to be a motivated person who pushes forward positive things in her life. And the kids who had that kind of freedom to get excited about whatever it is they were excited about and push forward with it through whatever media was the best way for them to consume it, I see those kids thriving as they get out of high school. And the kids who were forced to do this performative stuff that their mom saw on Instagram, they are not doing as well in terms of just staying on track, having goals and, and crafting, you know, really strong lives for themselves. It's such a shame that we don't have video <laughs> so that I can't clip that. I can't clip this. We can't clip mm -hmm. just a picture. I'll take a selfie. <laughs> take a selfie and we'll make that a clip Put no <laughs> no video clips of this this is all it's hidden this is this is the hidden episode the hidden the this hidden. is the hidden episode of the gen fullweiler that nothing i say henceforth will be clipped because we don't have video of this, <laughs> this it's, she's doing, though. so this is secret this is the secret episode that nobody will know about um <laughs> all right at least I don't have to worry about my bangs. I mean, that is, there you go. <laughs> they were on fire today, though. <laughs> I know. that. Well, but I, I was noticing some, they were, they were going the wrong direction. So now I don't have to worry about it because my expensive camera just died. <laughs> I, Caitlin, okay, you know what? I'm going to take deep cleansing breaths. <laughs> <sighs> deep cleansing breaths, which never relaxes me, by the way. Me either. <laughs> Let's get back into weight loss. Okay, so that's the main topic. This is kind of part two to what I was talking about last week. All this hot fire will never be clipped. So <laughs> this is th these will be secrets for you. Let's, let's establish again why I am the person that you should be listening to. Um, I, I just want to tell you who, who you're listening to. If you listen to other people, I was in the part of this. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm listening to a book about... Uh, dopamine and how it works and I was in the part about uh, weight loss and food and the reward system and how the difference between serotonin and dopamine and how food can come into play with that and I just want to play you a clip of the kind of non-gen nonsense that's out there um and Caitlin, don't don't jump into this clip. Definitely wait for until I call oh, for this course, one. Yeah. <laughs> now, some of you guys played this podcast with your children around. If if you have children, uh, if you're gathered around the fireplace and grandma's here and the kids are here um, and your priest is here, uh, just go ahead and skip forward about a minute. This content is a little bit PG-13, maybe two minutes. You know me. Uh, well, three. I'll probably perseverate <laughs> on it. Um, so... Uh, yeah, it's it's slightly PG thirteen. Caitlin, play the experiment one. Play that one. So this is what this is the kind. These are the people that you're hearing from. If you take advice from people who are not me, okay, play the experiment one. There's working together to shut down dopamine. This transition was caught on camera when men and women in the Netherlands were placed in brain scanners and then stimulated to orgasm. 
The scans showed that sexual climax was associated with decreased activation throughout the prefrontal cortex, a dopaminergic part of the brain responsible for placing deliberate restrictions on behavior. I, I just had to screen record that for you guys to just make the point that so much advice that is out there today is based on people masturbating in labs. I mean, it's like these people are not living real lives. Don't you wish we could clip that? See, yeah. there you go. We use that. Now we know why my camera died. Now God <laughs> was like, I know you're going to put that on Instagram if I let you get a clip and you cannot be on Instagram saying that anyone who shares advice other than you is basing it entirely on people masturbating in front of scientists. Like you can't no. No, that's it's literally why I'm my camera died. Off. Just watch the camera will start working after yeah, this episode. Yes. Um God is like, nope, cut, cut. He pulled the plug. <laughs> um, but that these people are like, they're not connected to normal life you know because then they this they you know they go on to say okay so this is how the based on what we know from these people self-pleasuring and us you know watching them they they were self-pleasuring while hooked up to electrodes interesting <laughs> well you know what that study was really about it was really about people who are not self-conscious at all <laughs> this is exhibitionist these people are flashers you mm -hmm. know what i would have done i would have had them all rounded up and arrested after the study because i would be like look <laughs> if you can like uh finish the job so to speak if you can finish the job <laughs> with electrodes up to your head and scientists like they have your name they have your yeah. social security number and they're like yes it took Caitlin White, uh, the so and so point, point seven second. Like, who could even get there? I would be like, you all need to be arrested. You're sex criminals. Uh, this is this is not a good group of people in this study. Who could? Who is that uninhibited? Oh. That they're like, hey guys, watch this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Here watch we go. God, I mean, and with that, and then they're going to give you advice about how to lose weight. They're like, listen. <laughs> We found some flashers. You know, we we <laughs> we went to the people who had been arrested from, you know, the special victims unit crimes and we got them <laughs> to do their thing while we watched. And here's what we learned about brain chemistry. It's like, are you sure this is accurate? Oh, and then, by the way, this is going back to, you know, letting your kids learn things from YouTube and from TikTok. I mean, these are the kinds of studies that actual, uh, you know, science is based on they're all crazy hang on I, I actually have another one caitlin you don't have it set up but i, I have another one <laughs> from that same book i mean it's like th this is another thing we sort of fetishize like oh if it's in a paper book if it's in a paper book then it must be just absolute facts i mean just just the facts of facts but here i'll, I'll just hold this up to the uh to the mic. Well, I don't even remember what this one is, but let, let's see what this, let's see what this one says. I'm just holding it up to the mic here. We don't have this one prepped. And you can't see how unprofessional I am because we have no video. <laughs> the reputation of dopamine as the pleasure molecule was further cemented through experiments with drug addicts. Oh yeah. The researchers injected them with a combination of cocaine and radioactive sugar, which allowed the scientists to figure out which parts of their brains were burning the most calories. As the intravenous cocaine took effect. <laughs> like, okay. They did what? Radioactive sugar. What? They did what? Huh? That's what I need to get through this episode. I'm like, where do you radioactive sign up sugar? for that? I need to be <laughs> injected <laughs> with cocaine and radioactive sugar. That's, can I have that as like my green smoothie for breakfast? <laughs> I mean, have, have you ever had a day where you're like, if I could just be injected with cocaine and radioactive sugar? <laughs> So uh, I, you know what I've I've noticed from watching my my son watch all these YouTube videos. I think YouTubers are actually more likely to verify their information and go into a little more detail about studies and such than regular book authors mm. because they have comments. You know, like in the comment, people can comment and be like, "I know what study you're talking about, and that one has been debunked," or "I know what study you're talking about, and that one only had five guys in it." Um, and so I, I just I hear in the background when my son is playing these videos very often 
they actually do have more of an eye for accuracy than mm. book authors because they, they, a book is in isolation. You know, I guess people could go pull up the Amazon review, you know, but most people don't do that. So again, do not be afraid to let your kids learn on YouTube and, and that that sort of media. Okay, but taking it back to people masturbating in test tubes. All right. So, so, oh, sorry. I hope you don't have your kids back listening. We said three when, minutes. When I say skip, okay. When I say skip ahead three minutes, what I actually mean is turn off the podcast <laughs> and listen. never listen again. <laughs> um, but no, but the point is, this is who this is who you're hearing from when you take weight loss advice from people who aren't me. And, and uh, there, was, there was another one. Actually, play the... Um, this is one. Okay, the the clip I'm about to play is from Melanie Avalon. I like her a lot. We follow each other on Instagram. So the, I say this very affectionately. That I think what she's doing is funny. I say it like affectionately. I like her a lot. I'm just kind of making fun at uh, she she's like a biohacker, and I'm just kind mm-hmm. of making fun at the at the things that they do because she she also gives advice for fitness and weight loss and things like that. Go ahead and play it, Caitlin. If you yeah, don't so. have that much and Melanie then you Avalon. need it, so you have like a cup of coffee, you feel like you can conquer the world. Or if you do a coffee enema. Coffee enema. Doesn't that tweak you? Tweak me? Yeah. What does that mean? Like I tried a coffee enema. I'm like, it is so hot. Like, oh, <laughs> no. You just, just like, lower it down a little bit. It's <laughs> fine. I think he was kidding about, yeah, I don't think, even if you're into <laughs> coffee enemas, I don't think you take the piping hot coffee <laughs> out of the, out of the, coffee maker or you could just saddle up to your keurig and you know just get it straight from the- <laughs> no wouldn't that be funny <laughs> wouldn't that be funny if keurig had like a hose attachment <laughs> for the, <laughs> the, keurig the people enema. who do coffee enemas <laughs> all right well now we understand why god killed the camera so that i can't <laughs> clip any of this um so this is it's all all right, still PG-13 content warning. We're not, we're not out of it if the kids... Listen, the weight loss industry is all people masturbating in front of scientists <laughs> and coffee enemas. It's, it's, it's all that. I give you the real scoop from someone who is living a real life. I have had a bunch of kids because that's the other thing. As I was saying in the last episode, a lot of these people, they're either men, which is fine, but it's a little different. I mean, you're you're hormonal profile does change a bit if you've had a bunch of kids and it's just kind of a different story and um or it's like you know they they don't have kids or whatever and and that's fine it's just different different things happen with your body when you have given birth to a whole bunch of kids and it and it does make it a little harder i i wouldn't say that i i i don't think it's a myth that it is harder to lose weight after you've had kids actually and caitlin you are welcome to disagree with me you've had four kids do you find that it is the same harder or easier to lose weight after having four kids harder for sure yeah yeah so uh oh <clears throat> all right hit the sound effect for jen's uh-huh. evolutionary theory corner <laughs> just because we don't have a camera does not mean that I can't share my crazy evolutionary <laughs> biology theories with you. Do you want to hear something that sounds mildly outlandish, but I'm completely right about? Oh, of course. <laughs> okay, okay, of course, of course. Of course. <laughs> That's everything on this podcast. <laughs> um, okay, and I think we're even out of PG-13 content. Okay, back Thanks. on track, we back think. on track. <laughs> Nothing but class here. But watch the, watch the camera start working. God's like, okay, are you done? Like, are you good. done? You can have your camera back. <laughs> okay, so um, here's my theory. When you look at all of human history, everyone was living in a Bear Grylls survival episode. If you've ever seen Bear Grylls, the survivalist, he, you know, they'll, he'll parachute into some godforsaken forest with a celebrity <laughs> and they have to figure out how to stay alive. And I, I really think it's kind of required watching for fans of this podcast. If you want to track with my thinking, you should really watch some Bear Grylls <laughs> episodes because one of the things it shows you is how hard the hunter-gatherer lifestyle is. I don't know what you guys are imagining the human experience was like before agriculture, which was fairly recent in human history. Uh, I mean, like 
98% of human history, we didn't have agriculture, like, you know, food that was, oh, hey, the plants grew that I planted right there. It was hunter gatherer stuff. Um, I don't know if you understand how hard it is to get anything to eat ever. Like, just watch Bear Grylls. Like, it, it was that. <laughs> they had some better systems, but it was mostly that. Um, so... There, each each village, each tribe had kind of a finite amount of food. So if the tribe expanded, you couldn't just snap your fingers and have more, you know, berries exist. You had your own territory. The other tribes would murder you very quickly if you went into theirs. And th there was just the land only had so much food to give you. And you were probably already maxing out how many resources there were. So um, let's say you had one baby, then two, then three, then four, then five. Okay, so now you have, you had one, well, let's say you and your, they didn't have spouses <laughs> back then, you and your man, <laughs> you and your partner, you had two people. Now you have seven because you had five kids. Um, the amount of food is still the same. So how are you going to feed all those kids? I believe that our metabolism slows down after uh, like when we have kids. And, and I, I kind of believe it is proportional to the number of kids you have so that we can eat less because hit, hit the life changing insight. Your life is about to change button. Ah, <laughs> oh, it's a shame that this is the secret episode. Cause this I is, know for real. <laughs> it's so important. Um, Having a slow metabolism does not mean you have to be heavy. It just means that you can eat less. It means you can save money mm -hmm. on food. You just, you, you can, you know, eat a small amount of food and still be full five hours later, at least not need calories. Whereas your 18 year old son who's on the football team, he cannot do that. He would just be starving if he tried to do that. You are lucky. You don't have to spend as much money on food as he does because you have a slower metabolism. Stop associating slow metabolism with being overweight. It, it doesn't have to to be that I, I have, I, I think I have like one of the slowest metabolisms ever. I swear I could eat <laughs> one grain of rice per day and be fine. I mean, my resting heart rate is seriously like 56 or something. My, my body is, it just, we just move slowly over here. It's probably why I'm always cold too. I have a very slow metabolism. Um, so stop looking at that. Like, like d don't associate slow metabolism with heaviness. Associate slow metabolism with being efficient, with saving money, with just not needing as much. Be like, hey, body, that was amazing. Great job, body. That's a really smooth move. I need less food now, and that's fantastic. I, I don't have to buy as much at the grocery store. You know, if, if you realize your metabolism has slowed down because of kids or age or whatever, you can look at it like, ooh, I can buy more expensive stuff at the grocery store now because I don't need as much of it. You know, back in the day, you were buying four 99 cent boxes of generic brand mac and cheese because you were 18 and active and, you know, that was like your snack in between <laughs> meals. But now you could buy one tray of high-end sushi for the same price because that's all you need. Yet four pieces of sushi will do you now because your metabolism is slower. And that is my evolutionary theory is especially as women, notice women complain more of their metabolism slowing down uh, more than men do, especially after kids. I believe it is because if we were all tribal cave women back 15,000 years ago, uh, you know, we there just there wasn't enough food to go around as you keep having babies. And I think we would just eat less and then give that food to our kids. So I think our bodies are, it's galaxy brain. It's so mm -hmm. smart. G great job, God. It's just <laughs> A plus. Now I, well, I do give God an F for killing the camera. Um, he and I <laughs> will have to have a convo about that. So my performance review, bad job on the camera, but good job on, you know, <laughs> the creating the universe. I, I like it. That great job. And on having women's metabolism slow down after they have kids, because I think back in the day, 10,000 years ago and before, um, 
I think that really helped us keep our kids alive. We could have just a teeny tiny bit of food, which is certainly all I need to yeah. not be fat. Um, <laughs> and then we could give the rest to our children so that they could grow and be healthy. Um, so that was Jen's evolutionary corner. You can hit the exit um, sound effect oh. there. That, no, that's it. Yeah, that was, oh, okay. that was it. That was the one. Um, Caitlin thought we had more than one sound effect. How about that? Um, not that classy over here. So um that that, really get that through your head maybe you do have a slow metabolism so yeah just eat less and be more intentional about what you eat eat higher quality cuts of food if you used to get the you know discount five pounds of ground beef maybe you can get yourself a nice little six ounce filet mignon and eat it across two meals because with your slow metabolism you just you don't need that much food and as i was saying in the last episode when I eat in a no cravings way, meaning I cut out all food that messes with my blood sugar and my uh, dopamine system, or I guess it would really more be serotonin system, but that you know messes with the feel good chemicals in my brain and blood sugar and, and, I, and I have intolerant reactions to, when I cut out all of that, I'm seriously left with like eight foods. I mean, I mean I, I could list them all very quickly. It's mainly salmon, steak, a couple of vegetables. Oddly enough, I'm okay with peanut butter. That's very unusual, but but I can do peanut butter. Honey, a little bit of honey is okay. Um, very hard. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, pears without the skin on because of the salicylate thing. The, there's a lot of salicylates in the skin. So anyway, it, it's not a lot of food. But when I eat that way, and my blood sugar isn't getting out of whack, and um, and so, and I just have no cravings. That again, cravings are different than hunger in the sense that cravings throw you into addict mode. I talked about that more in the previous episode. Okay, so when I'm in that mode of no cravings, that is when I can finally do intuitive eating. You might have heard about that. These are there are a lot of books about intuitive eating. Really getting in touch with. Um, you know, what, what, are you really hungry and do you really want that food? Here's the thing. When you have cravings, which for a lot of us is 90% of our waking hours if we're eating normally, um, even if we're eating quote unquote healthy, you know, if I eat spinach and broccoli, I mean, I, I will have cravings like I, I will be tearing through bags of candy so fast. It, you, it would make your head spin. Um, so many of us have cravings like 90% of the time and um and so we can't do intuitive eating that would be like telling a heroin addict to do intuitive heroin use it's like <laughs> no if there is black tar heroin sitting in front of you that your your brain is just firing in such a wacky way there's going to be no breathe deep and center yourself and see how much you, it's like, no, ah, like all of it right now inject this into my veins, literally. <laughs> like that's how I am when I'm in cravings mode and I see a breadstick, there's no intuitive nothing. It is just like, this is all going in my mouth. Um, immediately, it's like job of the hut mode activated. <laughs> I step into my full potato body lifestyle. Um, so that is, that's why it's so important to stay to at least be aware that it is possible to eat in a way that you experience zero cravings and when i do when i do that when i when i eat in a zero cravings way i eat only the foods that settle with me perfectly no intolerance triggers no salicylates for me cuz i have that intolerance no nothing processed no simple carbs uh, except for potatoes for some reason Potatoes are okay with me. Not sweet potatoes, though. Regular potatoes. Um, so when I eat in that way, my body tells me so clearly that it does not want very much food at all. At all. And this is not me starving myself. This is not me trying to be skinny. This is purely me saying, hey, body, let's just be healthy. Let's just <laughs> let's just feel great. Let's feel great mentally. Let's feel great physically. I will eat anything you want within the range of eight <laughs> foods that don't destroy me. Um, and just tell you, if you want me to eat twenty potatoes today, I will. Like I'm, I'm body. I am listening to you. And what my body says loud and clear 
when you turn down all that signal noise of the cravings and the simple carbs and the things I'm intolerant to, it's like, stop eating. I don't want that much food. Stop it. Di- digesting food actually is a lot of work for your body. Your body wants a rest from it. Um, I think especially as we age, uh, I've noticed massive increase in my energy when I eat less. It's just not something I can normally do because it's time consuming to eat in a zero cravings way. But when I do it, when when I eat in a zero cravings way, uh, guys, I will have maybe an, an amount of food the size of my fist once a day and then maybe something else half the size of my fist at another time and then just water like no no juices god no juices oh you cannot no 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 you cannot do juices um so just water and then an amount of food the size of my fist and then maybe one other bite half the size of my fist when i tell you that i am full I mean, I am like, it, it, ju- it seems gluttonous. It seems insane to eat more than that. My body is like, please do it. Please, please do not. We have more than enough. You've eaten high quality food. You, you just had some salmon and a pear without the skin and a, a little piece of potato. Please, for the love of God, do not eat more than that. Like it's, we're done. It is wild how little food my body actually wants and needs when you take out all the noise of the cravings and the the stuff like that. So all that is to say, don't bemoan a slow metabolism. Your body is just trying to keep your kids alive. And and even if you don't have kids, in it, I think if you're over the age of 35, 40, um, around those ages, you in, historically in a tribe, um, you probably wouldn't have been in, in the fighter range, you, you probably wouldn't have been one of the main active people because a lot of people like died at age 45. You'd be one of the elders. And so it wouldn't make sense for you to be consuming a whole lot of food because the tribe really needed to save that for the people who were hunting, gathering the women who were, you know, breaking down the buffalo and turning it into food, the men who were hunting the buffalo, that sort of thing. Um, you, you know, if, if you were not, one of the ones out running after a game to hunt and kill or doing all this work, then yeah, they weren't going to give you as much food. You were not getting as much food. So that would make total sense that your body would have evolved to slow down that metabolism a little bit so that you can stay at the same weight, still be a healthy person, but with less food. Hmm. I think that's why it works that way. Why can't we clip this? Seriously. See? <laughs> Lord, listen, I stopped all the crazy talk about people touching themselves in front of science. We're not even <laughs> saying that anymore. I'm saying good stuff and you still won't give me back my camera. Um, <laughs> we're out of time again. This Okay, the, I, I have more to say on the subject of weight loss. But be, you know what? It, you know, I'm not spitting any more hot fire because I don't have a camera for clips. We're an hour and eight minutes into this rollicking chaos. <laughs> of an episode. I think what I'll do is let me let you chew on that pun very much intended. Let <laughs> let me let you chew on that. Let me let you think about slow metabolism and how that is not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. You should thank your body. You should be like, great job, body. If we were in a primitive tribe, we would be thriving right now. We would be yes. healthy and fit and just girl bossing all over the place, even if the younger members of the tribe were like, hey, you're 38 now, uh, old lady. You don't get <laughs> any more food. Like we're, We need it for the warriors. Um, so just think about that. And then I, maybe we'll do a part three. Maybe we'll do a part three. Maybe we'll even have a camera. Wouldn't that be exciting? Ooh. Wouldn't that be amazing <laughs> if we had that? That's it for this fine episode. We will be back with you next week. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I have some great videos exclusively on my email list. Look up my email list. That link is in the show notes. And don't forget, I am coming to Seattle. I will see you there March 22nd. Can't wait to hang out with you guys in Seattle. That link is also in the show notes and at jfcomedytour.com. And I will be back with you next week here on the Jen Fulbiler Show.